Hey guys, Spencer Smith here, host as always of Self Under with Spencer. Today we're starting a three-part series on a sales master class, and my guest is Jennifer Bryson, one of the top producers in all of Mercer. Enjoy. All right, well, Jennifer Bryson, principal at Mercer, how are you? Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Spencer. This is this is so exciting. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad it's exciting. And, uh, you know, it's always fun. I was telling you when we walk in the door, I always love to see what people think when they see the studio because you see it from the other side and these frames on these cameras are so tight that you don't really know what the rest of the room right. looks like. So what were first impressions? Was this what you expected? Was it more than you expected? Tell me. More than I expected. Okay. Um, okay. Definitely a really nice setup. <laughs> is it? Yeah. It's impressive. Yeah. So good for well, you. Well, I wish it was mine, right? Like I can't take any credit for <laughs> well, it. Well, you should. You should say it's yours. Oh, yeah. It's my, I sit in my <laughs> studio. I come to my studio, right? That's right. Make myself sound more important than I am. So Jennifer, today... Uh, I think the, the subject matter is going to be sales. So anybody that is listening to this, um, it's best practices in sales and maybe not even necessarily, although you're in the employee benefit space, not even just employee benefit sales. If we could kind of zoom out even upwards from that and go, what is universal about the skill set to make a great salesperson? That's what I'd like to cover. And to toot your horn a little bit, if you don't mind, I know you had kind of a banner year uh, in 2021. And did I get it right? You were the number two two producer in the whole country at Mercer. Is that correct? Yes. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and it's crazy. And congratulations, by Thank the you. way. And I realize number two in the whole country at Mercer is a extremely high standard. So before we go into all sales best practices, and I want to get to know you a little bit, but could you talk to me about that year and what happened, you think, to make this like incredible year come to fruition? You know, I think it was just all the right things came to fruition. Um, I was returning back to Mercer. I had been with Mercer for about eight years and left and had gone to a, a competitor and had, had come back home. And I just felt like I had this renewed energy and passion to just bring all that I bring to the table. Um, had two wonderful opportunities that just really, uh, one in particular, nobody felt like it was going to be, uh, it would swing our way. And I was, I was in it to win it, as the client That's said. Nice. And the other one was just a, I leveraged a past relationship, and it was just one of those that they both just um, – and I had a terrific team. Um, you, can't, you can't do this job, um, especially at Mercer, uh, as a lone wolf. Mm -hmm. It's very much a hunting and packs approach. And okay. so it was being um, – assemb assembling the right team, the right matchmaking team, and being able to just like, you know – Make it rain. It was Make awesome. It, well, uh, congratulations <laughs> on making it rain. And I love, I love that terminology too. I know that's uh, one our industry uses a lot. Let me ask you though, as you're coming back, right? And you said this all came together. You had some past opportunities or relationships, but um, do you think also just we reach a point in our career where sort of our knowledge base, our expertise, our wisdom, the time spent understanding the dynamics of the industry, where everything sort of comes all just together perfectly for a period of time? Did you feel like that maybe happened as well? Yeah, I really did. I mean, I think it was, you know, both of the opportunities that were my, my two big ones that I pulled in just felt like they fit squarely in my wheelhouse. Okay. It was um, it was the relationships. It was the messaging. It was the people that we were working with. It was the right Everything just felt really, really good and strong, <clears throat> and I felt like I could really bring the best of me and Mercer to the team. Um, I, I think at the at the core, it was listening okay. and trying to understand what problem they were trying to solve, and then looking back and and meeting with my team, and then determining how we were going to best move forward with the solution, yeah, yeah, but it wasn't solutioning. It was really about listening. Well, that's, I, that's the misconception that I had in my own personal life. And I think we'll dig into this further as we go. But my outside perception before getting into sales was that you're smooth talking. You tell them all everything <laughs> they want to hear. They just love you. You're, you're great at relationships and high five and all that stuff. But I realized pretty quickly that to be a good salesperson, especially somebody like me that didn't have formal sales training at like a ADP or like a, you know, somebody that really teaches you technique. Right. I discovered that it, the more I listened to the other person, eventually get them comfortable and they'll share their pain points with you. They'll actually tell you what their problems are. And your job is to know how to kind of un uncover that. But then also I discovered, well, my job is to actually solve their problem. At the end of the day, as a salesperson, I'm solving your problem. I'm not selling you right. a solution. And that mindset shift uh, one made me more comfortable as a salesperson, but two made me a better salesperson, I think, as well. Exactly. I mean, I, we had an interview the other day with a senior associate, and it was someone that was going to be like on the H&B side, right? Mm -hmm. So not necessarily in a sales role like myself. And, you know, the, those 
resources have a quota and you know they're expected to bring in opportunities and she's like I'm not a salesperson I'm not a salesperson I said but you're a problem solver mm -hmm. and that's what sales is absolutely and she's like that made me feel so much better about it and I'm like it's everyone from the receptionist at the at an office to you know everyone is a salesperson in some way yeah and I think that also that was that discovery moment for me too it's like Oh, I may not be directly the salesperson, but maybe I'm supporting the salesperson. Right. Like I said, maybe I'm literally in taking a phone call of somebody that's irate and I know how to get them to the right person to sell. Right. Uh, everybody's selling in some capacity. And so it got me more comfortable as, as I got inside this world to go, no, I actually really enjoy what I get to do. And it's not what, I, from an outsider perspective, I thought a salesperson was. So, all right, we've already gone into it, which I love, <laughs> but I want to take a step back, Jennifer, because I do want to get to know you and I want sure. the audience to have a chance to know you. So give me some of your backstory. You can be as abbreviated or as long as you want, but I want, I want people to hear, you know, what has culminated in you sitting on the couch today, career, career as well as a personal life that you want to share as well. This podcast is brought to you by True Captive Insurance, a premier medical stop loss captive for employer groups ranging from 25 to 1,000 employees. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. That's why they take a white glove approach, making it easy for employer groups to transition into a program built specifically for them. Check them out at truecaptive.com. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that I've been along this journey of problem solving, it seems like for the last, you know, 25, 30 years, honestly. Um, I think that uh, if, I, if I look back, I have, I'm a, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a fur mom, I have two sheep -a doodles and mm -hmm. a really large 24 pound cat, <laughs> but <laughs> very large cat, it's a big cat. cat. Yeah. A big cat. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think at the core, it's about advocacy. And I, yeah. I've, I've thought about this a lot. And I really do think that what I bring to my clients and how I go about sales is through wearing this advocate hat mm -hmm. and um, I have a son um, who has cerebral palsy okay. he's in 24-hour nursing and um, he was <laughs> like four days old in the NICU mm -hmm. and a respiratory therapist comes to me and says the best thing you can do for your son is be his advocate and at the time I had no idea right. what that meant right. and I think as the years have gone on I've continued continued to be this advocate and I do it both in my personal life and my professional life and I think that that's what my clients and prospects see is that I'm advocating for their best interests hmm. I'm trying to solve their business problem and not my problem I'm right. not trying to solution them I'm trying to solve their problems and I think that advocacy plays itself out both personally yeah. and professionally. Well, so tell me, it's advocacy. So when, when you heard the nurse say that, when he was, your son was four days old, did you kind of understand even what she meant at that time? Uh, like, no. I'm his advocate, <laughs> right? What is it like? You, are you kind of, you're probably still trying to process everything and internalize things. So like, what did you think that meant? And what does it like really mean to you now, now that you know truly what that means? Yeah, I really, you know, I, I think I, I was so young. I was a very young mom. I don't think I under, even really s understood what being an advocate for him was. At yeah. that moment, it was keeping him alive mm -hmm. and then it became like getting him home mm -hmm. and then it became making sure he got the best level of care and then it became you know this moment where he was about four years old and this gastroenterologist was talking to me about what we should do with his feeding tube and he was telling me we needed to do da 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 and I was like I don't I don't think that sounds right that doesn't seem to have he just not having the symptoms for that mm -hmm. and I felt kind of that advocacy in me mm -hmm. right you know that advocate rising up where mm -hmm. I was like I disagree with you mm -hmm. and he couldn't believe that I was challenging him because, again, I was a young mom. I don't think he saw that mm -hmm. coming. And it, ha it was the right decision. Yeah. And we ended up not needing the procedure that the doctor wanted us to have. And I felt really good about that decision. And so I think that... I think that whether it's through the healthcare system or <laughs> billing or challenges or whatever it is, mm -hmm. I feel like that advocate in me comes out whether I would necessarily well, so want it to or not. That's a proverbial mama bear, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you're yeah. protecting your son. I, I love that, though, because there is a, there is, most people perceive a, a doctor or a surgeon, whatever, having a, an air of authority of yeah. understanding and, like, to challenge them, almost some people would be uncomfortable in doing right. so. At the end of the day, this is, is your son, right? right. And so I, I'm proud of you for, for doing you. that. But, I mean, I think probably that speaks to how you operate in the world. Um, how has that experience and you know obviously this is a daily experience you said 24-hour care how does that sort of motivate you or inspire you in, in your work I'm sure there's no question of why you do things uh, on yeah. a daily basis right my why is truly to leave a lasting legacy for him um you know he he has two stepsisters but he's an only child um 
and being able to have something left behind for him. Um, early on, we established a trust for him. It's nothing substantial, but it's something that is his, and it's something that will continue to grow. So I, as I earn money and as things grow and evolve in my world, I, I want to make sure that he's taken care of. I don't ever want anyone to think that he's not important enough, mm -hmm. that he's not number one, and that I want him to have the very best care. And so I think my drivers in the workforce are about – you know, solving my clients' problems, right? Mm -hmm. But in if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in the right way for them, I win too. Yeah. Well, I think you in the in aggregate, you're doing good for the world, right? I think if you want to get sort of lofty about what we <laughs> do, right? I mean, you don't want to overstate what we do, but you do do great things. I mean, if you start to drill down, hey, I brought forth a solution for this employer that freed up this amount of capital to be deployed to hire people or give them better benefits. Yeah. One individual or many individuals may have benefited directly from that improvement. Their quality of life right. may have changed. Like, so if you start drilling down a few layers from what you and I interface with on a daily basis and realize the impact that we can have, right. again, we can do a lot of good in the world, even if we only do it in our, our, our small, small corners right. over here, right? Right. So I appreciate that. That's a very powerful story, and I Thank appreciate you. you sharing that as well. Well, and I, I'm appreciative of the advocacy you do for your son. Um, it tells me a lot about who you are as a, a person as well. So what about sales, though? Like, I want to talk about that, if you'll permit me to go really deep. I want to pick your brain. Yep. I wanna, you, you're obviously very successful at what you do. How did you get started? Like, when this notion of selling or being in sales, did you have training? Did you have a first job? Where did it all originate for you? Oh, well, I actually started off at doing, like, a – professional services travel coordination so I had okay. these these travelers that were that I was supporting and they were trainers it was an on a it was an SAP and they would actually go out and meet with clients and train them on different SAPs and so I would be a part of the different trainings of them like getting prepped and yeah. ready and then I would do all their coordination and travel and then um, honestly they had a trainer that couldn't make it and I already knew the talk track so well they're like hey can you go out and do this training oh, wow. I'm like oh yeah sure I, I think I can and did and um you know ultimately got an opportunity to go in front and uh, did a nice job and then they're like well hey can you can you do this sales because we can't go out and do it and so I ended up helping with sales and it just kind of evolved itself and I think it's just the fact that um well, so you kind of got thrown in the deep end a <laughs> little did. bit right right I did well it's always fun. I love hearing stories like that where a person just is like hey we need you and you're like ah but you don't realize maybe you've been pre preparing for it up to that moment because you're watching you're listening you're learning from other people and then you get thrust into the spot Spotlight, if you will. Yeah. Um, and, and not to say it was sink or swim, but you had the opportunity to kind of take a step up in your career and it sounds like you, you were able to thrive. Like, do you, do you remember going back to that first time and maybe how scared or nervous you were giving a presentation? Oh, I can't even imagine yeah. how terrible I was. <laughs> I just can't even imagine. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I, I don't think I did anything to embarrass myself too bad, but I know that I'm pretty sure that, um, my stomach was very upset yeah, that day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, butterflies. <laughs> so. Oh, I still, occasionally, every once in a while, you'll get a big enough presentation, like you start to get those butterflies yeah. and remember what it's like to get excited but anxious about a presentation. So did you realize, did you discover you had a knack for it, though? Did you think you were good at it? And or did you go, oh, I really like this? Did that have an, uh, did you have an epiphany um, during that time? I don't think I did at that time. Okay. I think it was more about, I think it just started evolving itself. And I saw that I was good with people. And I've never, I've never really considered myself good at sales. I've considered myself a good problem solver. Mm -hmm. And so I really do think that it was more about just being with people and having a conversation and things just organically happened. Yeah. So I don't think I ever thought, I'm going to be a salesperson. Yeah. I think it was more like I'm a client advocate or I'm a relationship manager or something like that. I've never really hung on to that sales word. And so I think it's really about just... I, you know, as a child, my mom used to think that I would get kidnapped um, because I would talk to any human being um, <laughs> and I would make friends yeah, with strangers. Yeah. We moved around a whole lot. And so I just have always been able to have easy conversations with people and listen. And I think that that also speaks to the fact that I have a nonverbal child who doesn't speak mm. and I have to read his body language and I have to communicate at a different level with him. And I think wow. that those play into each other in a arena when you're fostering relationships with people and so that's that's very that's <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting the fact that you're saying so you have to have a even a, an additional layer of soft skills that most people may be not develop because yeah. of that nonverbal. okay so so you probably do have a sixth sense if you will <laughs> but i think spidey I, sense uh, spidey <laughs> sense but i think it also speaks to the fact that 
truly actively listening to somebody is absolutely a, uh, a superpower, I think, because it's, it's not just listening to get to an answer. It's not listening to wait to speak. It's listening, following, following threads, but also being able to pick up on verbal or nonverbal cues while you're listening to go, okay, here's what I think they're communicating to me, or here's what they're not telling me, right. but I see on their body they're telling me. I think those skills absolutely are what make a good person go to a great salesperson is, is that type of stuff. But what about like actual formal? Did anybody ever sit you down and say, here's how to close a case or here, you know, did you have what people would consider that formal historical sales training? This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end -end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at PlanSight.com. Yeah, so I've done the, the, the Miller-Hyman training, the blue sheeting. I've done the Challenger series. I've done the Asking Effective Questions. I've, I've, you know, I've done a number of different programs that, you know, would be considered you know, sales-ish, but it's, I'd say that most of my training has been more around the consultative sale mm -hmm. and being able to um, listen and then lead people down a path so that you can then ultimately execute and, and put kind of a formulation together around what the solution is for them. So it's not like, hey, here's, here's a nice little technique to get them to reveal information or to get to a close. I mean, some of that maybe works, but I, I, my perspective, and this is my perspective, I don't like tips and tricks. Yeah. I hate that stuff. I think that's an, an I don't want to say unskilled person, but that's a person that's trying to cheat their way yeah. to success. And it's also your manip it's manipulative in my, yeah. in my opinion. And it, I think you get found out if you do that a lot, yeah. right? So like I stay away from that stuff, but has yeah. there been any sort of technique that somebody hinted or you saw somebody do themselves that you go, oh, that was pretty interesting or I see what they did. Have you ever had that? type of moment? Yeah, I mean, I think that part, you know, I think my approach to everything is, is that I, that I do my research. You know, I, mm. I don't go to any conversation with a prospect that I've not um, looked at their LinkedIn bio. I've not read up on their company. I've not, I've, I've looked at their 10K. Um, I've d looked at the most recent press releases. Mm. Um, you know, I do a lot of research on the back end. Um, and then I learn about them as a person. I think that um, that's important too. So finding some things, I'm a relational salesperson. So I, my whole thing is about building a relationship and rapport with someone. I'm never going to know all the answers. I'm never going to be the smartest person in the room, but I'm really good at building a relationship with someone and making them feel like they matter to me. And they really do. Yeah. Um, I joke that once, um, you know, once a client, always a friend, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even if you don't want to be my friend, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're always stuck with me. Yeah. Um, and I love that I can look out in the marketplace and still, still see so many of my friends that are still in the, in the business that, you know, come to my events and, you know, it's so nice to see them, whether we can do business together today, but right. maybe it's in the future. But I think it's, it's, um, you know, doing my research. And then I think that the, the, the ability to have the small talk is important. Mm -hmm. Being able to build rapport, not just go in and just go straight to what, what problem are you trying to solve? Yeah. It's a small talk. Um, you know, I think it's, and then it's about truly listening to what that problem is and trying to make sure that they understand that I am listening to them. And then I think it's the follow-up. I think it's truly about letting them know that you are working for them and then, mm -hmm. Um, staying in touch. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a five-step process, yeah, yeah. but it's not, you know, it's not overly complex, but it's, I think it's more just human skills, like letting yeah. people know that you care, that you're going to pay attention, you're going to listen, and then you're going to stay in touch. And I think at the end of the day, um, people want to work with people that they like. I agree. And I think as long as I can, not everyone's going to like me, um, but I'm going to have, I'm going to try really hard. I'm an only child. <laughs> so I think everyone wants to be my friend, but I think at the end of the day, I'm a really nice person. I really do care about people and that comes through. Well, I think so too. And, and the likability is absolutely, um, I, that brings me back to, I used to do, like I studied on camera acting. Um, and one of the things that the acting coach told me is like, Hey, who, who's your favorite actor? Like, tell me maybe, do you have a favorite actor, actress real quick? Yeah. I don't. Okay. I, okay. I'm so, sorry. You put me on okay. the spot. Yeah, I didn't mean to do it. But so the idea is like when you describe, your favorite actor you're not like I I am a fan of that person because they're so good at wex it's like oh I like Matt Damon or I mm -hmm. like Ben Affleck or whatever the name I like and mm -hmm. so what he was trying to communicate to me was there's something he calls the called the pill prince pills principle positive interesting likable and simple if you're mm -hmm. in an acting uh, scene or doing anything 
If you kind of stay around those four pillars and be positive in what you do, be interesting, be likable, and be simple. And most people describe an actor that they like, I like them, is mm-hmm. how they describe, you know, whoever they're the biggest fan of. Yeah. So that likability, it, again, not a trick, not a technique, but what parts of your character or of your, you as a person do you hone in on, right? Mm-hmm. Do you know, like, hey, I want to exemplify this, or I want to make sure people are aware about this of me. The likability, again, that's a skill. That's yeah. a soft skill. And it's not something you can read in a book, right? right? And that's what I've got. I, I don't even know if I've ever, I've read a few sales books, mm-hmm. but I can't remember anything out of those sales <laughs> books. But I can remember, there's an example, there's a gentleman in town, I studied under him, his name's Eric Templin, he's a Brown and Brown practice leader, had him on the podcast, I'm a huge fan of his as a person. Before I got into sales, I got to go on renewal meetings and watch him go through the process. I got to go to prospect meetings, and I started to see cues of the way he talked, the way he Mm -hmm. listened, the way he emphasized certain points. I'm like, oh, okay. Whether he's doing this intentionally or this is a subconscious thing that he's doing, I got to see firsthand a great salesperson Mm -hmm. do stuff. And I think that was a far better training ground than anything I can read in a book. But that's just me. Again, I don't know. You may disagree or maybe you've got favorite books that you've written that have changed your life. I I don't know. No, I I think that... I think that you're you're spot on. I think that what I've tried to do in my career is identify um, mentors and uh, people that I wanted to emulate in mm-hmm. the workforce. And I think that that I attribute um, much of my success, almost all of my success, to some very key people that were instrumental in basically raising me up and right. affording me opportunities. And I think that I try to emulate their style. Um, I tend to be more um, playful and energetic, and mm-hmm. people will use the word bubbly, but we're not solving world hunger here. We're mm-hmm. not saving lives with what we do. And so I think that if you can have a little more levity in your approach, um, people tend to relax a little bit. And I think that those are some of the mentors that I've had in my life that have been very successful, and I've mentored myself after them. And again, I wouldn't say that they were overly salesy or by the book people either. It's just more about stylistically and how they engaged with clients. And I've tried to emulate that. So we all stand on the shoulders of giants. We all have seen people before us that are very good at, and like you said, you sort of emulate or you pick up on those cues that you embody and then you put your own version on it, your own Jennifer, you know, your own Spencer, whatever you want to say, your own spin on kind of that skill set. Um, because you're a unique individual and, you know, your skills are your skills. Right. I'm curious. So you said you were a relationship seller, um, which I love that. But I know there's an, uh, oh, Nathan, geez. There's a, <laughs> as a technical component to what you do as well, right? So is one of the things that you know artfully as a salesperson is what you do well, but also maybe what you ought to bring somebody else in to add flavor to? I mean, is that part of being a good mentor is actually knowing oh, if I have my own personal deficiency or I don't like to do this, yeah. having the right team around you as well, right? Oh, again, that, back to the hunting and packs. I mean, I, I think actually at Mercer that the teams kind of tease me because I use that term so much. I am the maestro. I'm the quarterback. I No one comes to a meeting to hear me talk. They come to hear the people that are in the room, mm-hmm. my, my assets as I call them. Um, and they come to hear them talk. And so I think for me, it's about understanding what we're trying to solve for and then making sure that they have, that they know that the certain words that they say are going to resonate with the client because I've done the listening. I know the things that they're trying to solve for. So we're going to, we're going to use the words that they use back to them. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that my team knows what to say and when to say it, not that they're, I'm trying to script them, but to make sure that, well, we're trying to drive home a solution that we're using the client's words back to them. Well, but it emphasizes that you listen to them at the end of the day. They want to hear themselves. (laughs) Yeah, well, most people want to hear themselves. (laughs) But I think even understanding that as a salesperson and having let them do more talking even than you, like there's an understanding that they want to be heard, right? They're in this meeting for a reason. It's not just a, oh, I'm going to check a box because I wanted to have Mercer on the list. It's because I want to talk to Jennifer and I'm hoping, I'm praying that she helps us solve this problem. Right. What about um, virtual, right? Because yeah. that's something that's been weighing heavily on my mind and my opinion of what I think about virtual selling versus in person. So we all had to morph to virtual for a period of time. And now it's time will tell how that becomes a reality long term. 
How did you have to alter your approach to sales going virtual? Yeah, good question. So I um, I reached out. There's a company called Corporate Visions, mm. and um, they are wonderful storytellers. They they tell a lot of stories by drawing, and I'm a visual learner. And so, as they were kind of showing some how to tell a story, they started doing annotation on PowerPoints and drawing on whiteboards, mm. and that I was able to retain everything they said so much better. And I thought, if I can learn that way, so can my clients. And so I quickly adapted that style okay. into my my presentation. So being able to actually uh, draw a circle on a PowerPoint uh -huh. or to be able to write a number or something like that, it, it people retained that so much more and were kind of shocked by it. And they stayed more engaged because it wasn't death by PowerPoint. It was, what is she going to draw? Or she's a really terrible drawer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but at least it was dynamic. It Either was way. dynamic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was dynamic. And I, I learned that um, we're, we're all just so busy, right? We're mm -hmm. just, we're, all, we're, we're going 90 miles an hour, even virtual and even now. And um, they refer to a process or a, a theory around the hammock. Okay. And that um, people hear about... 70, they retain about 20% of what you say at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm wrong on the stats. 70% at the beginning of your, okay. of, your, of, your, of your talk. And most of the time we're talking about who we are, what we do, how big we are. We would show the map. We show all the different stuff about our company. We're not giving them the meat mm -hmm. in that 70%. And then the 20% is typically when their attention is lagging, mm -hmm. which is the hammock part of... The hammock. I see. And then they typically will hear about 70% of when you say in conclusion. Ah. Then they come back. Oh. And so I think that So part, they check out in they the middle. They check out in okay. the middle. It's okay. called the hammock. And so I think that what I've learned is to try and identify some key messaging and to um, say what I want them to hear, say it again, and then say it again at the end. Mm. Um, as far as like, you know, what are those three three things that you want, I want you to remember about us. And so I think that for me, and maybe it's my Baptist background or whatever, <laughs> but I think everything is in threes. And so I always try and identify, if you don't hear anything else, these are the three things that I want you to hear. And then I say it at the beginning, I say it in the middle, and then I say it at the end. Mm, and I, I like think that. that those are, I don't know, maybe a little bit of strategy. That, I mean, that's a technique, you know, but it's not a trick by any means. It's just simply, hey, if I understand human behavior, which I've been getting obsessed about human behavior mm -hmm. and behavioral psychology and stuff. It's like, if I understand human behavior, who am I to say, oh, I'm going to alter human behavior because I'm so interesting <laughs> that people will like completely throw away right. their own characteristics because I'm so, so you know, captivating. Right. Or, hey, if this is human behavior, let me just understand how to, um, what would you say, not take advantage, but um, adapt to what I know yeah. human behavior actually is, right? And so if that's the case then why wouldn't you do right. it, right? Like that's just an obvious thing to go, okay, if I if somebody studied this and they tell me this is why this works and this is what works, then who am I to say, no, they're, they're wrong about that? Right. Okay, so that's very cool. And thank you. The, mm -hmm. So you called it the hammock. Mm -hmm. Like if anybody's listening today, maybe this episode <laughs> will be called the hammock. So what about um, your virtual selling? You, you mentioned kind of the, um, the whiteboarding and dynamic, but what about adapting to this idea? I've got to be on camera. I've got to be over a Zoom. Did you hate it at first, or would you? Did you go? Okay, no, okay. I embraced it. Oh, you did. Okay. I loved it. Um, I feel like I learned so much more about people through a Zoom than I would if I was in an office with them really? or in a in a meeting because you would be sitting there having a conversation with them and their dog would come through and you would see how they would react to their dog or a child would come through, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, need help with something. And then you're having to see them kind of react. And so you have a moment of understanding their family or you can see their room and you can see how they decorate or you can see family pictures or, or you can see a piano. <laughs> and so you're like, oh, are you a pianist? I mean, you can, you find so much more. Yeah. And with me being a relationship salesperson, yeah. it allowed me to have so many different things that I actually find engaging. And with, I have two sheep doodles and they would always find some way to come on camera and distract or bark or, you know, they now have learned to manipulate me. When they see me on a Zoom call, they know if they come in and bark, they're going to get a treat. Ah. So, and then I can't be ugly in front of... So they've of, trained you. <laughs> they've trained me. Yeah, that's funny. I'm yeah. very trainable. That's funny. <laughs>
<laughs> well, yeah, it is. I, you know, early on, I, you would have to apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. Like my mm-hmm. dog barked or oh, my daughter would love to interrupt Zooms. And, you know, you kind of expect, okay, she's going to come in. I got to address this and then she'll leave. Yeah. But then you then you realize, oh, I don't really need to apologize anymore because it's literally this happening is our to life. everybody else. right? Yeah. But then I think we're obviously gravitating back towards in person. So how have you taken the skills that you've learned in the virtual world and now reapplied them to what you're doing maybe more in person again today? I mean, I think it's been exciting, right, to be actually be like in front of people totally. and be able to have a conversation. And I think that I, I, I wouldn't say that it's been drastic for me because I think that it's, I felt like I was on Zoom so much and I got to know people so well that it was, didn't like being able to meet them in person. Or I think what I've realized is that we're a lot shorter and taller on camera than we are in person. Um, yeah, I'm shorter, <laughs> unfortunately, and I've heard, heard that a couple times in I person. only wear heels to work because whenever I first, when it's, because I was rehired at Mercer and the team, um, they only knew me through Zoom. Mm-hmm. And the first in-person thing, they're like, oh, you're much shorter than I thought. I'm like, well, Gee, I guess thanks. it's being fatter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. So well, th- thank you, I guess. Yeah, and it's, yeah. I think so. But yeah, no. I, so I really have enjoyed the kind of getting back in front of people. Yeah. Um, but I do think that people are still so tied to their computers, so tied mm-hmm. to different zooms, that getting people out and getting people into the workforce has been has been hard. And I know that I have a lot of sensory overload when we go in for our anchor days at the office where I'm like, oh, there's a lot being in front of people all day. There's almost a lot of inertia, right? Like you just get used to the virtual world and you get used to cramming 10 meetings in, in yep. a day. And then you go, oh, well, now I have an in-person meeting. I've got to plan for traffic. Right. I maybe got to bring something. Then right. I'm going to have an hour meeting, then traffic again. But I got to get here. You know, the logistics, you forget how difficult logistics are yeah. when you're actually going in the car and going somewhere. Exactly. But I also know the level of excitement when I do that as well. I have an in-person meeting in a couple of weeks and it's a breakfast demonstration and there'll be a bunch of people there and I'm like, oh, I'm like literally <laughs> looking forward to it yeah. because it's just, even if anything, it's just a change of pace over, over right. the screen in front of me. Um, what about stories? So, like I, I love sales stories. Every salesperson has some favorite events, whether good or bad, you know, yeah. a sales story that they have. So is there anything that sticks out in your mind that's like your, one of your favorite stories to tell? I do. And I, 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 there's probably some watchers that know the name Daryl Hart. Um, okay. He recently passed away and I, he mm. was at MoneyGram. Mm. And um, I, this was with my former company and I had gone in and I was like, just give me a few minutes. And he was like, I'm not moving the business, keeping the business where it is. I'm like, okay, okay. Just listen to what I have to say. You're just being a nice man and I'm a nice person. So just listen to mm-hmm. me. And so we ended up having a conversation. He had his, his coworker in and during the conversation, she would go ding, ding, <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and we would look at her and she's like, she's saying all the right things. That's and I was like, oh, I think, um, I think Cheryl likes me. I'm like, it's okay, Daryl. You're not moving the business. We already yeah. established that. And so we went through the process. He's like, well, why don't you come back and let me put a meeting with so-and-so. And I go, well, but you're not moving the business. So just remember that. And so yeah. he's like, I'm not moving the business. And we ended up winning the business. Yeah, and course, to yeah. this, to this <laughs> yeah. day, um, and he recently passed away about a month ago. And oh. he was still one of those people that was, um, he was just a little crusty around the edges and just kind of had his own opinion on things. But he was just so funny because he was so militant that he was not moving that business. And Well, that's what you pick <laughs> up on that right away. If that's the first thing somebody says to you, you're like, oh, he probably is going to, like, if I do the right thing, <laughs> he's telling me that because he doesn't want me to believe that I have a chance, but right. I clearly have a chance. Right. And it's funny. <laughs> do you think there's anything that you were able to pick up on that really hit the mark for what he was looking for after that guard came down? Like, was there something that you think, oh, that's why we won this piece of business? He needed to look good with his leadership. Ah. And if I could show some kind of savings or ver- better value for him, yeah. then he would look better in front of his leadership. Okay. And we did. We were able to do that. What happens when you get that BR, the BOR, and you guys clearly had to joke about you're not, you're still not moving the business, <laughs> right? As he's signing the paperwork. Oh, I've, I've completely harassed him. Just, yeah. it was just nonstop, but it was just one of those that yeah. it became like our funny. And I love that. I have it. I have that with a lot of people. I love to find something that's like special between us and, uh-huh. and just harass them about it. But that became like our special. And you know, it was just one of those that he was just so funny about it. And I, he, he really did seem like he was happy. And I, I really don't love to shil- steal sheep from other people if people are happy. And if, again, if I can't, if I can't solve the problem, I still want to be your friend. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he was one that it was just funny because he was just, got to do both, I right? got to do both. Yeah. What about, do you have any like horror stories though? Like everybody's probably got like the call that went wrong or, you know, something like that, that pops out of your mind. Like, oh. whew, I want to eliminate that from my memory type thing. I've had lots of really sad losses. 
is. Okay. Like I put my heart and soul into mm. uh, pursuits, and I had one in particular, and it was a, it was a nursing home, home health care, and again that plays really close to my vest, mm-hmm. and um, I just there's no way, and I even told them I'm like, look, no one is going to be a better account manager than I am because no one's going to know your business the way I do. Mm-hmm. Like you can't not give me your business. And, um, they, they didn't, <laughs> I was <laughs> devastated. I was just devastated. So like to this day, it's one of those that's still at the back of my mind. But my, my, one of my, one of my opportunities last year was a home health care business. Okay. And I was able to erase some of those negativities because yeah. it was a home health care business. And it was something well, that, that, that just speaks I knew it was mine. It's, out, it's a lot of this is still out of your control. You can do literally everything right yeah. and not win, or you can make a lot of mistakes and somehow still win the business, right? Because right. at the end of the day, somebody else has to be convinced to say yes and they're going to do a lot of things behind the scenes or they're going to have their own biases they're going to have their own stuff going on in their right. own life that might impact you know you look like my ex-wife right, right. Or some, something like totally out of your control um one of my favorite stories is more just kind of silly as i was a uh, there's two that i think are funny but i was a young salesperson at sun life i was trying i just trying to do a great job um i what was going on a trip to west texas was like two minutes late for my flight. I mean, not late, but like late where they wouldn't let me board. It was mm-hmm. like, oh, you've missed the window. You don't get to go back through security. Sorry, you can't go. And I was like, well, I have to, I have a lunch meeting <laughs> in West Texas. I have to be there. And they're like, well, there's no flights. You can't go. And, and so I looked at the map. I pulled up like ways. I'm like, well, if I leave now, I can get there. It was about a five and a half hour drive. Keep <laughs> in mind, I have like a, like a souped up like Mustang mm-hmm. that I'm driving from <laughs> Dallas to West Texas. And I go cruising, cruising through Lubbock. You know, you start to smell the cows and right. like, the manure as you get in there. And I made my meeting and I told the people that story. They're like, you should have just told us. Like nobody <laughs> would have cared. You didn't have to literally drive from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. to get here to this <laughs> lunch meeting. It's not that big a deal. But I thought, man, you know what? I can't let them down. I yeah. can't cancel this meeting. And I look back and go, wow, what if I knew what I knew now? I just said, Okay, sorry, I got to reschedule. Or, but would you? I, well, I don't know. I actually, actually kind of like the the rapport that was built yeah. from that, and uh, I probably got a couple brownie points for doing whatever it took to get this lunch meeting. Right. And so may, maybe I probably would have done yeah. it again. The other one that I, I like to tell is um, I was going on a plane with my boss and uh, my mentor, who was kind of like leading me into teaching me about stop loss sales. We're getting on a plane, and it's a Southwest flight. <laughs> And Southwest doesn't have assigned seats. Mm-hmm. They kind of got close to each other, but I didn't. And I was going to be on the next row over, um, but I was going to be in the middle seat. And I asked the stranger, I was like, hey, would you mind? He was in the aisle. And I'm so naive and dumb. I'm like, <laughs> would you mind if I switch your seats so I could sit next to them? And both of my colleagues are like, oh, my God, I can't believe you just asked the guy to give up his aisle seat for right. your middle, middle seat. seat. <laughs> but he did. And then afterwards, I, it dawned on me, oh, geez, that was really dumb to do. And I'm trying to give the guy his seat back, and he won't take it back now. And then, they, of course, they razz me to this day about how silly it was. But those are some of the things that you just do, the silly little mistakes you make that also I think kind of endear you to people also yeah. realize. How everybody's human and it's okay, yeah. but I can still viscerally remember those two <laughs> things. <laughs> More just embarrassing about myself. But um, so we we touched on this earlier. I want to go back to it if you don't mind. Some other misconceptions that maybe a person outside of our industry or a younger person trying to get into sales. Like, what are some misconceptions that you really want to make sure that they dispel before getting into this industry? We're on a mission to partner with the most innovative companies in America to fix health benefits one plan at a time. NavMD has created a blueprint that delivers world-class benefits to 155 million Americans. Better benefits starts with data intelligence. Our platform is empowering the next generation of advisors to zero in on opportunities to optimize the plan, build the right team, implement proven strategies and solutions. Join us on our journey to revolutionize health benefits. Let NavMD put you a step ahead I think it's it's a good good question. I mean, ultimately, I think it is that it's not about you know. I think that people think that sales is the lot lizards at the car dealership, mm-hmm. and they're like the feel of the wheel seals the deal kind of thing. <laughs> and you know, I don't think that I don't think that that's what it is. I think it's really about learning um, some of the behaviors. I think it's being aware of your surroundings. I think it's truly about just being human mm-hmm. and just trying to find your way. Because, you know, I mean, everyone has their own their their own things going on. And I think part of part of what we all have to realize is that um, 
just going to work every day is not what people are doing every day yeah. these days. I mean, they've got families, they've got, you know, there's so many stories and so many book, you know, don't judge a book by its cover kind of thing that, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and everyone has their own crud that they're dealing with. And I think it's just trying to break through all of that and understand that what we're doing here is about a livelihood and it's about doing what we do well. You know, again, I think I said it earlier, I'm, I'm never going to be the smartest person in the room, but I'm probably going to be the one that's going to listen to you the most and make mm. you, I want people, I want people to make me feel good. And so I feel like I, that's my love language is I like for people to feel good yeah. um, when I'm around them. So I don't know that that's a misconception, but I think it's more about just, it's, it's not as hard as it seems and it's not slimy yeah. and it's not, That's a great way to you know, it. it's not anything that um, you can't be proud of. I mean, I, th I really do think at the end of the day, what we're doing is just adding value and solving problems. Well, so let, let me invert that question a little bit. So what are some of the things that you want other people to know about this career, like from a quality of life perspective? Of course, everybody gets latched onto income potential and earning yeah. potential, which is a big part of it. Yeah. But like some of the other things, the less tangible things that make this a great career path for somebody. I mean, I, I, mean, I really do. I mean, I, th I think I, say, I said it earlier. I mean, like I, I, I get to function as a quarterback. Um, I get to be, you know, I get to put the right team together based on what my clients' needs are. Um, it's like matchmaking to me. So mm -hmm. being able to say, oh, I needed this person or I needed this person. I need someone that can speak to this. And so for me, it's about like really trying to put the right team together and then help solution to bring the, the right value to the client. And so I really do think it's about, you know, being in a, in a spot where I can do all of that. Like, it, so I'm advocating for that and I'm, I'm, pu I'm pulling all the, all the levers that um, are bringing the best value to those clients. And so I think it's about, you know, do you like talking? <laughs> check. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, do you like adding value? Check, check. I mean, yeah. I think you can kind of go through and kind of identify things that, you know, not, it's not made for everyone. Some people are just too shy. Yeah. Some people just don't have the confidence, but I think that it brings, I think it makes you more confident to be in front of people and to know that what you're doing is really truly you feel passionate about what you're doing yeah. and I get so excited when we're putting things together because I feel so confident that we've done all the prep I mean I make I, w our teams have to go through two to three rounds of preps we had a finalist visit a couple weeks ago and we did three two-hour preps oh wow that's a lot to that keep is, people yeah. like attention span and we would go through and say what are you saying here and how are you saying it and it's it becomes about making sure that you're not wasting anyone's time mm -hmm. I don't want to get feedback from a meeting that it was a waste of their time and we didn't listen to anything they had to say I want it to be I appreciated that you you know referenced our questions on your slide that you put the presentation together based on what we wanted to hear right. and not what you wanted to say right that kind of stuff that's that's like all the pats on the back and kudos and atta girls and high fives I could get in a day is if I get that kind of feedback, then I know I've done my job. Well, as I say, if, the, if there's any indication your preparation for today's uh, discussion, right? Like I, <laughs> people can't see it out off camera, but the notes, if that's any indication <laughs> of how you approach your, your job, I can see why you're, you're so successful. But preparation, uh, this takes me back to when I was in high school, there was a, a, a forward on our team and he is kind of a country guy. And he's like, you know, you remember the uh, notion of prior Preparation prevents piss poor performance. I don't know if you've ever heard that. No. It's a bunch of peas. You're it's way like younger than I am, though. Okay, <laughs> but he's always like prior preparation prevents piss poor performance, and I like I remember that to this <laughs> to this day. But it's it's a notion of hey, the people that typically win, especially when you guys have an equal skill set, right. is how much work you did in preparation for right. that game or for that finalist meeting or whatever. Those are the people that will win if everything else is equal, because that preparation will shine through in your performance itself. Um, so anyways, just that <laughs> triggered a very old memory of mine, which is funny. But So what it, we'll wrap things up with a couple questions left. So we touched on this before, but I really want you to give me your crystal ball look at the future of sales. Like how is this industry going to continue to evolve as we go more virtual, as there's things like social media selling and all sorts of other ways that you can non-traditionally sell? Like what do you envision is, is going to be popular in the next couple of years of either how to sell or just in general how our industry might morph a little bit? I think it's going to continue as a hybrid. I think that what we what we saw through the you know the last couple of years is there's there's just going to, people have gotten to the point where they really want to have it all. They want to have that work life balance and they want to be able to continue that hybrid approach. So I think that I think we're going to probably have to continue to do a little more virtual 
mm-hmm. as well as a little more in person. And I think we're going to have to adjust and kind of recalibrate as, yeah. as those opportunities kind of come and go. Um, I think there's a little bit of backlash. I think people are tired. I think they have Zoom fatigue. I do too, yeah. And so I absolutely think that we're going to have to start finding some creative ways to get getting, um, you know, getting some – messages across mm-hmm. you know one of the things that we did recently was um you know we, it was a finalist visit and we were told that we, they were most likely not going to do a finalist visit so i had one of my lead consultants actually do a um a video of himself talking mm-hmm. about the value yeah. proposition yeah and sent that as a link to Beautiful. you know to the you know to the prospect we didn't win yeah. unfortunately they they stayed with the incumbent but i feel like doing some things that are a little out of the norm yeah. is going to be how you get some attention. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's, it's about doing everything that we're already doing. It's, it's about listening. It's about paying attention. It's about being creative. I think it's also going to continue that forcing the networking, uh, forcing the relationship and the rapport building outside of your network so that you can look for ways to get in. Cause people at the end of the day, they're just overwhelmed. And I sound just like everyone else. And how can I sound different? Mm -hmm. And I can sound different if I have someone that said something good about me. Uh-huh. So like just a, a referral, if you will. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I think it's you, pulling levers around okay. um, referrals, um, working your network, understanding who um, could potentially you leverage um, and just finding some creative ways so that they can see that like I'm, you know, like I, I've got a finalist visit in um, two weeks and I'm like turning over every rock, you know, they're wanting to save money and I'm turning over every rock I possibly can. I'm using my network. I'm using um, our sister company. So I reached out to Marsh. I looked, you know, I looked out to other companies or other within our, in our world to be able to say, can we save them money? Can we do something different? This business is currently here. Is our opportunity here? So it's, it's beyond just what we're solutioning for today. But as a business, they've got money going out in all different ways. Mm-hmm. If I can find opportunity or is there some reciprocity? Is there some business that could do business with them? Yeah. I mean, just really trying to get creative in how we're approaching the market and our, our clients, I think, is where we're going to have to well, just... When I was going to say, you know, I'm curious your thoughts... Um, we met through LinkedIn, right? Mm-hmm. And I actually put a feeler out, like literally just kind of a call to action. It's like, hey, who are the best salespeople in our industry? I want to talk to the best salespeople. And your name came up. And it came up through LinkedIn, through a mutual connection. That's how we got introduced. Right. So I'm curious, how do you leverage social media um, to in order to do some of that? Yeah. Back finding prospecting. So I, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Uh, we use Sales Navigator as well within within Mercer. But I do um, a little podcast, not as cool as yours, but it's called <laughs> okay. a Snapcast because Snapcast. I'm not as cool as you. It's, okay. it's a little snappy and it's a little sm- uh, shorter than a podcast. Okay. Cool. But I do Snapcast where I um, highlight different solutions. Right now I'm doing a one on healthcare buzzword bingo because there's so many okay. acronyms in the yeah. marketplace and trying to help people understand how, how people are solving that. So trying to find some ways so that people can and see me um, through LinkedIn and see that I'm in the industry and that I'm wanting to try and add value. And so I think that all of that will continue to morph itself, but nowhere near to the production that you oh, have. Well, that's so well, I mean, I do. <laughs> Low I gravi- rant over here. <laughs> I, well, I do it. I gravitate towards this because I enjoy it, but also mm-hmm. because I feel like, well, this is the thing that I think I can leverage, right? If I don't like to do other things that a typical successful salesperson does, well, how do I leverage this? If this is what I like to do, yeah. I have to justify my time and expense to do this. And if it's coming to fruition, it's paying off, then that's the proof, right? That's the proof of concept. And so it has, right, fortunately. Right. But I'm just like, I'll go on in this idea and let me let me beta test to see if it works. So I just, I enjoy it, but I've seen the power of social media be leveraged in other capacities. I know you make reels sometimes, probably mm-hmm. more personal reels, but you know, those things are fun because yeah. you never know what can have some virality to it or have some reach that creates a connection or a right. piece of business. Um, so let's wrap it up. I know we all, we're uh, getting close to lunchtime here. But Jennifer, closing thoughts. I really want to just hear, you know, kind of what you want to leave the audience with or a little nugget of wisdom you want to drop that help me kind of land the plane here on this episode. I, well, really, I just want to say thank you very much. I mean, I think highlighting... Um, Highlighting a sales approach is always exciting and fun. Um, I don't, I I don't, again, I don't think of myself as a salesperson. I think of myself as a problem solver. But I think at the end of the day, if we can just do our clients and prospects justice by not wasting their time, listening to what their problems are, trying to find the right solutions and, you know, being good humans, I think is really, you know, I think at the end of the day, all I try and do, I want to, I want to end the day feeling like, did I add value today? And I I try that. I try and do that every day, and not every day do I get to say that I did. But I try really hard to be a good person and add value. I want to say, being a good human, I had that epiphany a few weeks ago. I even made a little mini video about it. But it was like, if you want to be a good salesperson, at the end of the day, 
be a good human, mm-hmm. listen to somebody, understand their needs, care about what they're saying, make them feel special. Right. Those are all human characteristics right. that translate into sales. So I really appreciate you joining me. Thank you for helping me do this sales master class. Uh, it's been an honor to sit down with you and a pleasure to, to get to know you. So thank you, Jennifer, and I hope we get to do it again soon. Thank you, Spencer. This was fun. My pleasure. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. Check them out at truecaptive.com.